you know, it's kind of weird to be sharing a, a message like this because I, I think just even a few years ago, it would have been kind of awkward for a single guy to be doing a sermon on <laughs> addressing your husbands. And, you know, it's, it's been kind of a neat um, process because uh, as a pastor for, this is like, wow, year nine right now, um, I've had actually the privilege of being, being able to do like premarital counseling um, jointly with other pastors, even when I was single. You know, and it's kind of like, you know, you're sitting there in this chair and you're saying, oh yeah, you know, as a husband you should do this, as a wife you should do this, and you're thinking, gosh, you know, it's easy for me to say this, but (laughs) honestly, I'm not in those shoes. And so it's kind of like, you know, you know what God's word is and you don't doubt that, but there is a little bit of empowerment, there's a little bit of authority that comes in when you've actually kind of walked in those shoes for a little bit. And even like doing weddings, I, you know, I I even officiated um, weddings before I got married. And I just thought it was the coolest thing, you know, just being able to be a part of that and being able to see this union that, that um, you know, before there were two and God brought them together and they were one. But, you know, actually having gone through a wedding ceremony and now being married, you just kind of see things in a slightly different light. You appreciate it so much more. You're kind of like, wow, the vows that, you know, people were taking um, one to another, it's like, wow, I can actually live that out and I can actually see that. And I can see the power behind it. I can see also some of the difficulty behind that. And so this experience um, of being able to share this with you today is just, uh, it's a unique privilege. And yes, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to lie, I've only been married a couple years. Some of you guys, like, totally dwarf that. You're probably ten times married. In fact, um, can I just get a quick show of hands? Who's been married here for, like, more than 15 years? All right, nice. More than 20 years? More than 25? Oh, I look Uncle Bob. He's going to hold his hand up for like the whole message. Okay, all right. You, you win. You win. Um, this is like one of those uh, wedding things where they always give a prize away, right, to the couple that gets married longest. But, I mean, so, you know, I might say some stuff today, and you guys are like, Psh, man, that guy has no idea what he's talking about because let me tell you about being married. But, you know, um, I... I I think I have figured one thing out is that even in just a couple of years, you know, marriage isn't easy, right? And, you know, you marry guys like, duh, you know, that's, that's pretty obvious. But it's, it's such, um, it's, it's, you know, Pastor Joe kind of talked about this uh, a few weeks ago when he was talking to single men and single women. You know, like the grass is always greener on the other side. And when you're a single person, you're kind of like, man, you know, that's, that's like my next goal. That's like my next life stage. And that's the next thing to aspire to is that, you know, we just, I pray that God would give me that desire to be married. And then once you're there, I mean, the grass is still green, don't get me wrong. But, <laughs> but you're like, but it's not as easy, right? And it's, it's not as rosy all the time as it might appear. I'm going to go ahead and show a video clip from a very powerful movie about marriage. And I think this particular clip just kind of sums up just some of the everyday stuff that sometimes comes up in marriage, which is not typically easy. Okay, that's taken from the movie Fireproof, if you guys have not seen it, especially if you guys are are married, highly, highly encourage you guys to see that movie, that's just a snippet of it. But what we saw in there is just an example of some of the the difficult uh, conflicts and differences that kind of arise in just the course of being married. You know, the the world offers uh, a variety of, of standards, right, of what they think marriages should be about. They offer suggestions on, well, this is what the husband should be, this is what the wife should be, and this is, you know, kind of the deal. But um, fortunately, um, we're not subscribing necessarily to everything the world has to say, because if that were true, we wouldn't have, you know, over half of marriages ending in divorce. Instead, we want to go ahead and look at the Bible and see what God's word is for, for this most just precious uh, union that he has placed, and the biggest blessing that he's um, placed for her husbands and wives. Today we're going to talk about uh, just three things, especially the husbands, that we can do to really just remember, revitalize, and hopefully um, refresh our perspective about marriages. The first thing that husbands were called to do, love. Okay, It seems pretty straightforward, and it's, again, it's one of those duh kind of things, but we want to see love in probably the most precious and special way that was ever illustrated in the Bible. 
If we can go ahead and look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 30. I'm going to go ahead and read this out. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. Christ loved the church. And the illustration that is set forth here by the Apostle Paul is that husbands are to love our wives in that same way as Christ loved the church. You know, I always looked at these verses, and, and it was interesting. I kind of re- reflect back on when I was single, and I remember a time uh, a while ago, <laughs> a long time ago, uh, in my 20s, when I was single and, and I knew that there was this uh, single Christian gal. Uh, well, I didn't know she was single, but she was a Christian gal. She was cute. <laughs> and uh, I got to get to know her a little bit. I kind of assumed she was single, and I was like, hey, you know, um, you know, at some point, you know, through our communication, I kind of said, hey, my name's Anton, and, you know, what's yours, and yada, yada, the interaction started happening, and and it kind of came up, you know, to the point where I was going to ask her out, right? But I want to make sure the post was clear. And I said, um, so, uh, yeah, you know, you seeing anyone? Do uh, you have a boyfriend or anything like that? And she kind of just goes, yeah, I got a boyfriend. His name is Jesus. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you mean like he's, he's Hispanic. His name is Jesus, you know? <laughs> no, no. Wasn't that lucky. It's like, no, Jesus. I'm like, oh, man, you know what? What are you supposed to do with that, right? How can you, you can't compete with that. It's like, she played the Jesus card on you, man. It's like, game over, man. Um, and I always thought, it's like, man, that's, that's just, you know, seems so unfair. How can, how can these, I mean, yeah, she's a godly woman, and I just love how she, you know, aspires to find just that kind of quality in a guy, but I'm like, who can hold up to that standard, you know? But um, story goes, this guy later on, you know, did get married to a just, you know, really godly man and, and really happy for her. And I kind of reflect on that and I go, you know, obviously there's not going to be one guy who's perfect and one guy who's flawless because there's no one that is comparable to Christ like that. But when she's saying it in that heart and when she's sharing it in that manner, She's talking about just, she's saving her heart, and she's guarding her heart, and her standard is so high because she wants to be pursued and loved and cherished by a man who has his sights and his heart set on God. And, he, and she wants a guy who's going to love her in the marriage context like Christ loved the church. And that is just, that's an awesome thing. And, I'm, and, you know, and to carry that mentality, yeah, Initially, it's a little bit of a shock to the system if you're a guy. But then you realize, you know, there is something to aspire to. And Jesus, the way he views women and the way he views marriage and the way it's outlined in Scripture is that we need to present our wives and cherish them like the radiant bride that they deserve to be. Not just for the first few months of marriage, not just as newlyweds, but through the course of this beautiful union that God has brought together. Jesus Christ represents the perfect representation of love. Uh, Jesus is a symbol of God's unconditional love, acceptance for us, even to those people that have rejected him. He represents uh, forgiveness of all crimes, past, present, future. And most of all, I think, Jesus just epitomizes the ultimate sacrifice of love. As we know what God did by sending his son down on the cross for you and I, 
There is no greater sacrifice than that. And that, to me, represents the kind of sacrificial love that is required for a husband to be able to show his wife, as outlined in Scripture. Essentially, Jesus is the uh, ultimate bridegroom. So what does love look like? You know, sometimes, um, you know, we, we talk about that. I was like, okay, I want to love my wife, and I want to love her like, you know, Christ loved the church. Sometimes, though, I just throw up my hands in the air, and I'm like, man, I just don't understand my wife. I don't, I don't get her, you know? And, and one, one little lesson that I've kind of got through even just these first couple years of marriage, and by the way, I already got clearance from Karen to talk about her, so don't worry. <laughs> um, it, it's just that it's weird, but you can't take for granted that you know what your wife is thinking or feeling, even though that's what she says she's thinking or feeling. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Some of you guys are like, what? And some of the women are like, yeah, I think that, that could be the case. Um, because it, it comes down to being able to accept unpredictability in your wife. I think as husbands, sometimes we're like, you know, just lay it out straight, man. Black or white, is it A or is it B, you know? And even when your wife might say it's A, she's really meaning B. And when she says B, she might really mean A. And you just go nuts, and you're like, come on, man, what is going on here? Is this, is this like a Jedi mind trick? Are you, are you, what are you doing to my head? And in and the end, you, you kind of have to go, okay, you know what? I have to accept the differences. I have to accept the fact that, you know, women think, feel on a different level, in a different manner than guys do. And when we try to view them and compartmentalize our wives into a way of seeing it like we do and saying, no, you've got to think about it this way, you've got to view it this way, then that's just going to lead to the friction. That's going to lead to just that constant tension that could arise in marriages versus being able to go, God, I know that you created my wife differently. And I I celebrate that. Not even just accepting it, but even being able to celebrate that, embrace that. Because what you might find in the end is those differences, instead of letting those differences exasperate you and just get you infuriated, they actually might complement you and make you and your marriage all the more complete. Because God is bringing in a different aspect of that. So I think the question I want to challenge some of the guys today is to ask yourself, what is, what is one thing, or what are, what's the top thing that sometimes I just do not understand about my wife? And not just gripe about it, but to dwell on that and meditate on that. And, and if you're coming from it from a perspective of love, you won't view it as, oh, I've got to fix her, as opposed to, I'm going to cherish her for who she is. 1 Peter 3.7 also has a, a really good verse for us. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Actually, that's just, I just want to leave it at that. Um, I want us to look at that and go, wow, be considerate. What does that mean? Um, I, I have a confession. And uh, yeah, so the last couple months, um, I've been having an affair, and it's, yeah, it's gone on for, since about April, and her name is the Seattle Mariners. <laughs> and I say that because sometimes, you know, at the end of the day, I'm like, man, I got to go home and watch the ball game. Or I'm at home and I'm going, I wonder what Ichiro's batting average is today. Or I go, oh, I wonder what we're doing in July. I, we have a vacation scheduled? Yeah, but we could be playing the Phillies that day. I want to go to that game. Karen, I'm sorry for sometimes, more often than I should be, placing this thing as an object of my time and energy as a priority over you. 